Chapter 7 Cora Her feet ached, stupid fucking heels hat she'd stupidly decided to wear on a stupid fucking Monday that had started too fucking early and had ended stupid fucking late. But her head ached more. Because Dale was being Dale. And he was exhausting. No, she was exhausting, too. It was just, she was done. So fucking done. But Voldcom was so close, so freaking close, and she wanted to be part of that. She'd just, send out her resume and bide her time in. Deep breaths. Lots of deep breathing and meditation and non-virgin margaritas and... She'd extended her hand, reaching F.O. the knob, readying to push open the door when the wooden panel ripped open, and Rafe stood directly in front of her. His expression was absolutely thunderous, and as she stared at him, trying to process the fury, his fingers wrapped around her wrist and yanked her into the house. Oof, she grunted, sprawling against his chest, palms feeling, stuff she really shouldn't. Okay, feeling muscles and man in. See? The stuff she shouldn't feel. They probably knew because the moment they were clear of the door, he dropped his hands from around her wrist and stepped back, fist clenching like touching her skin was akin to picking up a pile of dog shits with his bare hands. And that made her feel other things she shouldn't. Clearing her throat, shoving down that hurt, she moved past him, dropping her laptop bag on the table, trying not to limp but knowing she was because her shoes hurt physically more than the emotional hurt of Rafe acting like she had rabies. Or maybe it was the fury in his eyes like she'd done something to disappoint him. Or maybe it didn't matter because she was tired and hungry and tired and... What the fuck are you doing? Her head dropped back, eyes hitting the ceiling. Why don't you ask me a real question, Rafe? Why the fuck don't you tell me why you were out of the house before five and now back after eight? His brows arched onto sharp seas. Because by my calculation, that's a 15-hour day. She huffed and kept walking. Around how do you know that I'm not getting back from a hot date? His laugh was sharp. Because it's not even 8.30? Asshole. Yeah, he said, the words hot in her ear. Damp and warm and sending goosebumps prickling down her nape, I am an asshole. A beat. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong. I care about you, Cor. I'm trying to take care of you. Fuck. Now she was so pissed that she was yelling at him out loud instead F in her head. Even if she was an asshole. Even if he deserved to have her yell at him. I don't need someone to take care of me. I'm an adult and... Yeah. You are, and I'm an asshole who doesn't deserve to be one of you. She frowned. Wait, what? But none of that means I'm wrong, he said, stepping closer. The heat of his chest came very close to her spine, that nearness tugging at the threads of thought from her mind, scrambling and nodding them. Because I'm not wrong, am I? Fury sparking to life, she spun on her heel and jabbed a finger in his direction. What I'm not doing is spending another second dealing with your bullshit, and that includes you questioning me about my life and my job and what fucking time I come home from it. So, you're admitting that you've just worked 15 hours. Ugh. She threw her hands up, and spun on her heel a second time, and sweet Christ, that hurt. What I'm doing is none of your, ah. One second, she was stomping away, and the next she was in the air. Rafe's arms were around her, one at her waist, one behind her shoulders, and then she was colliding with his chest. She shoved at that chest, his muscles bunching beneath her palms, but she might as well have been trying to push her way through a brick wall for all the good it did her. Then they were moving, or rather, he was, carrying her across the kitchen and plunking her onto the counter. Sit, he growled. I'm not a fucking Dion. She'd barely come to terms with her ass hitting the granite when Rafe backed up. But he didn't go far, just bent and yanked one shoe and then the other off her feet, chucking them over his shoulder. She heard them collide with the cabinets behind her, one after the other. You better not have chipped the paint on my... 
suddenly, his face was right there. In front of hers, his lips. She inhaled sharply. You're limping, he growled, because of these dumbass shoes. They are not dumb, she growled back, because if he could growl, then so could she, damn it. They are expensive and sexy as hell. So, you just need to, she started to slide off the counter, but before she could, he planted a hand on her thigh. One bob broad hand totally encompassing her thigh. Limping. One word. Intense. Sharp. Sliding down her spine. I'm fine. His hand convulsed. Fingers tightening, his thumb pressing against her inner thigh, sending a bolt of heat skating between her legs. Another inhale, her lips parting in. Fifteen fucking hours, more growling. Her chin came up. She pushed his hand away. It's my fucking life, and if I want to work fifteen freaking hours, then I can. His eyes sparked with fury, green depths flashing with gold and brown, blazing into hers. His hand returned, and then the other one dropped onto her other thigh. You'll burn yourself out. He was right. Which pissed her off even more. She was burned out. Because she was exhausted and ready to quit and desperate to not be working 15-hour days. But she didn't need the overbearing asshole telling her what she was feeling and what she should be doing, and fuck, if she wanted to wear uncomfortable heels, then that was her freaking prerogative, even if they were giving her blisters on the backs of her heels and she wasn't sure if her arches would ever recover. But it was her life. Not Rafe's. Not her brother's. Not Dale's and, fuck, but it was way past time that she did something about that. She shoved his hands back. Get out, she snapped. Get. Out. Get. The fuck. Out. The anger faded from his expression. Cora, honey. Get out. Get out. Get. He kissed her. Just slanted his mouth right across hers, parted her lips with a swipe of his tongue, and then he was kissing her. Plungering her mouth, kissing her so deeply that she almost felt like the contact was bruising her mouth. And she didn't care. The slight bite of pain was overwhelmed by pleasure, by the sheer storm that was Rafe. Fingers threaded into her hair, tilting her head back. His tongue darted deeper, stroking along hers. His hands were back on her thighs, spreading them wide. He stepped between her legs, hands sliding to her ass, tugging her forward, tugging her even closer, perching her on the edge of the counter. But she didn't fall. He had her, close. Oh, God. He had her close. He shifted, hands drifting down, coaxing her to wrap her legs around him. And, oh, that was good. So good that she didn't hesitate to also wrap her arms around his shoulders, to arch against him, to bring the body flush to his. Two. He tore his mouth away from hers. One second, she was dangling in a web of pleasure, her limbs and torso wound tight in the silk, floating weightless and out of her mind. And the next. That spider was coming close. That spider was descending, readying to devour her. That spider, was gone. Leaving so fast that her feet hit the hardwood with a jar that clinked her teeth together, her hands scrambled to grip the counter behind her, so she didn't end up on her ass. The front door opened and closed. Her lips pulsed. Her breaths came in rapid gusts. Her legs shook, so hard that she found herself sinking to the hardwood anyway, sinking slowly but inexorably down to the cold, solid surface. And she sat there, the pleasure slowly fading, the pain in her feet creeping back in, the fatigue, the mental drain, the... Tired. She was so, so tired. Chapter 8 Rafe He needed to go jump off a bridge. Like literally, to put himself out of his misery. Definitely, before Cora told her brothers that he'd accosted her in her kitchen. 
I was just trying to take care of her, by shoving my tongue down her throat. Fuck, he muttered, getting out of his truck and yes, slamming the door shut. Luckily, he was alone on this stretch of the highway, the street lamps few and far between on the curving road that followed the coastline of the Pacific, so no one was around to hear him have his hissy fit. Fuck, he said again. Fuck. He gripped his hair, tempted to yank it out by the roots, and forced out a sharp breath. Cora didn't want him butting into her life, so she sure as shit wasn't going to sick her brothers on him, not when it would bring the full force of the Hutchins clan down on them both. Fine, he said, rounding the back of his truck and hopping up to sit on the side of the bed, his feet dropped onto the tire, holding him in place when he felt as though the rest of the world would crumble beneath his feet. It's all going to be fine, he muttered to himself, staring out to the ocean, not able to see much aside from the occasional white froth of a wave breaking, even with the full moon overhead. Dark and dim. Kind of like his brain. He snorted, hands fallen to his sides, gripping the edge of the bed of the truck, the cool metal nothing at all like Cora's skin. Soft like silk. He curved lush. Her mouth was hot and sleek her tongue a heated brand as it tangled with his. Her moans rolled up the back of her throat, drifting across her lips. He'd swallowed it, absorbed the soft groan, and felt it sear itself onto his soul. Onto his cock, his brain coming up with all sorts of pleasurable imaginings of how her lips would feel on the head of his dick, how good that warm, hot tongue would be stroking up and down his shaft, how? Fuck, he hissed again slamming his palm against the metal, the loud reverberation even drowning out the waves. Or maybe that was his pulse pounding in his ears. Because he shouldn't be thinking about his cock and Cora, her mouth, and how fucking good it had been to have her thighs wrapped around his waist. For all intents and purposes, she was his sister. But hell, he had never gotten so hard from a fucking kiss. Ever. Why did it have to be Cora? he whispered. He blew out a breath, or maybe it was a sigh, or maybe it was just a fuck-his-life exhalation because he knew why. Because he was fucked. Rolling his shoulders, he stared up at the lightning sky, his face sticky from the damp ocean air, his eyes burning because he was too fucking old to be sleeping in the back of his pickup truck with nothing for a bed except a couple of balled-up sweatshirts and one thin blanket that he used to protect anything that needed protecting when he was hauling it around, wood, furniture, appliances. But it didn't protect his back. And how he was exhausted, sticky from the salt in the air, and his back felt like it had been jabbed with a million needles, and not of the acupuncture variety. But the sun was coming up, and he needed to get his ass in gear. Because he needed to work himself into exhaustion so that his brain all but melted, too tired to think about what has gone down with Cora. See? Good plan. Muttering a curse, he pushed up out of the bed, used one of the sweatshirts to wipe off his face, snagged the blanket, and folded it, stashing it in the extra sweatshirts in the cab of the truck. Thankfully, he'd had the sense to commandeer one of the company vehicles for his use while he was in town. Otherwise, he would have had to get a hotel the night before. Actually, he should have gotten a hotel the night before. Then he would have skipped the whole needles jabbing into his spine thing. Right, he muttered, rolling his shoulders, feeling the breeze from the ocean whip up and test through his hair, the fog rather than the night sky obscuring the waves now. He stood for a minute, listening and staring at the undulating clouds, the mist gathering in places and spreading thin in others, knowing that this wouldn't be his last visit, that there was something that felt like home here. That maybe that sense of home was more than the ocean or the winding roads hugging a coastline. More than redwoods growing tall and strong along the shore, more than the invasive ice plants taking over the dunes. And he worried that where he felt most at home was in the small craftsman Cora owned with the sturdy wooden columns, their bottoms wrapped in stone, on Cora's porch with a rocking chair and pots of cheerful flowers stashed in the corners. Walking through Cora's wide front door. Sitting on Cora's sleek gray couch and knowing that it looked atrocious but was incredibly comfortable. 
opening and closing chorus white cabinets and setting out plates on chorus stone countertops. Padding across chorus warm hardwood that he'd installed himself, along with Asher and Wyatt, much to chorus fury, especially since he'd cancelled the flooring contractor she'd hired. Using chorus spare bathroom with the tile he'd installed. Striding up chorus stairs, holding onto the handrail he'd screwed in, making certain it was secure so that she would be safe. He got into his truck and turned on the engine, his head spinning, his throat tight. Because he wasn't stupid. Because he could sense the theme. Because, he wanted to avoid the truth, had to avoid it. But the truth kept smacking him in the face. Cora. Home. And that was what worried him the most. Shit, he muttered, the drill slipping, the screw falling to the floor, the bit digging into the sheet rock surrounding the windows he and Teresa were boarding up. It was dark, well past quitting time, and he knew that the only reason she'd stayed late was that he was here, doing something he was here, doing something they could easily send a crew to do in the morning. This property had closed just before five, and so he was technically the owner. He even had the keys and alarm codes in hand, along with the requisite excitement that came from possessing something in the tens of thousands of square feet, something that would become businesses that real people used or office buildings where real people worked and knowing that he was responsible for that. But even with the requisite excitement and being the owner, Rafe understood that he didn't really need to be boarding up windows. There hadn't been issues with squatting. There weren't any break-ins or even equipment and tools on site that someone might try to steal, and he's already arranged for his security company to watch the buildings, and the entire complex, overnight. They were covered. He was just, avoiding. Cora. He was just avoiding Cora. Right. Simple. Cowardly. And, yup, good times for that. He held the wood with one hand, snagged another screw from the belt hanging around his hips, and plunged it between his lips. Then grabbed another because at the rate he was going, he was probably going to lose another half dozens of the pointy metal bastards and position it beneath the drill bit. This time, he was able to screw a piece of wood into the frame without creating unnecessary holes. So, he repeated the process, screw beneath bit. Screw in the wall, a screw from the belt, screw beneath bit, screw in a... You, okay? The bit wobbled. The screw dropped. He steeled himself, lifting his eyebrows in question when he turned his head to meet Teresa's eyes. She'd finished her windows and was watching him with concern written into the lines of her face. You, okay? She asked again. Yup. He muttered around the screw still held between his lips, turning back to face the wood, thankfully finishing the job without making any additional holes, without dropping any more screws. Just peachy. Of course, it was just a bonus that she couldn't really hear him since he was still all but chewing on the sharp metal fastening. But it also meant that she came closer, holding the wood on his next window while he screwed, coming close enough to see his expression and probably the turmoil within his brain, making his fingers rubbery, his mind fuzzy, his. You're not okay. He lifted his shoulders. Drop them. I'm not okay, he said, telling her the truth, or the safe part of it, anyway, because Teresa could sniff out bullshit with the best of them. And, to add to that, it didn't help that he was a shitty liar. I'm tired, he added before her concern could swirl to worrisome levels. I didn't sleep well, and Cora isn't all that thrilled that I'm at her place, he detailed the sex talk and the margarita night with her friends. Teresa smirked. Sounds like fun. If you want to take a flamethrower to your ears so you don't hear about your best friend's sister talking about bondage during a sexy time when she's supposed to be innocent and pure forever. Except she hadn't been pure when I'd been sticking my tongue down her throat, had she? He gritted his teeth and shoved the threw away. It was made easy because Teresa burst out laughing, straight bending over, holding her belly, laughing as she sputtered, pee-pee pure, with a huff. And in an innocent? Teresa, he growled. 
She put her hand up, palm out. And no, she said, still sputtering, no, I can't. You want a grown-ass woman to be pure and innocent? He glared. You've totally lost it, she said. I know that you think of her like a little sister, but come on. More laughter burst forth. I'm not seeing the humor in this. You wouldn't, she muttered, seeing as you're a big, protective alpha who can't retain your protective alpha status unless you're rescuing poor, helpless maidens. His glare didn't abate. That's not fair, he said. I've never once stepped on your toes in this job. Gentle snatching amusement and she stepped close, bumped her shoulder with his. No, Rafe, you haven't, she tilted her head from side to side. Okay, well, you did step in and threaten to shove a pry bar into that one sub's eyeball on the Kowalski job. He grabbed your ass when you bent over to measure the baseboard. Her lips twitched. He did, another bump of her shoulder. But maybe the pry bar eye threatening was unnecessary? He grabbed your ass, Rafe gritted, and couldn't keep his eyes off your boobs. A pat to his cheek, one of the ones on his face. Which is why you're a big, proud, protective alpha, she murmured in a sing-song voice, with big, proud, protective alpha tendencies. He hissed out a breath. Teresa, he warned. Big, proud, protective alpha tendencies don't make you bad, she said in a tone that was so consoling, he knew it was purposely aggravating. Gah. Woman. It just makes you a big, proud, protective, annoying man, she grinned. And I can say that because I have two annoying, proud, protective brothers and an annoying, albeit lovable, proud dad. Rolling his eyes, he took the battery out of his drill, picked up the screws from the floor, and turned for the exit of the building. The windows were done. All that was left was to set the alarm, lock the door, and go home. To Cora. He inhaled slowly, silently. Fucking hell. Rafe? He narrowed his eyes at the still-smiling Teresa. What? he asked gruffly. Carbs. His brows pulled together. You're in the doghouse, she said, hitting the button on the alarm panel and then holding the door closed so he could lock it. The best way to get out of that is to invest in carbs, ice cream, baked goods, gourmet chocolates. Pick Cora's favorite and bring it home as a just because, she smirked. Trust me, it'll be the best thing you can do to remedy your living situation. Right he said, pocketing the keys. I'll do that. A nudge, a wave, and they exchanged goodbyes. Then he was in his truck and on his way to invest in his body weight in carbs. Because he didn't just have to get out of the doghouse. Had to buy enough carbs to get Cora to forget about that kiss. Chapter 9 Cora Well, maybe she'd scared him off for good. One kiss from Cora and see how they run. She blew out a breath and rotated her head from side to side, trying not to think about the fact that Rafe had fled after the kiss, that he hadn't returned the night before, and she knew because she'd barely slept, and most of that sleep had happened on the kitchen floor after she'd sat there in a depressed haze, feeling sorry for herself. If he'd come across her, he definitely would have ordered her to an actual bed. That being, not the hardwood floor in the kitchen, the only benefit of her makeshift bedroom was the heater vent that had blown warm air along her side, thus ensuring she didn't turn into a human popsicle. When her stomach had finally rumbled loud enough to shake her out of her haze, she'd grabbed a bag of carrots from the fridge, a jar of peanut butter from the pantry, don't judge her, they were good together and had gone up to her bedroom, the real one, that was, where she had consumed two-thirds of the peanut butter and the entire bag of bay carrots, listening for him to come home while doing he level best to make certain that her consumption of veggies didn't bring any actual nutritional value, or that her consumption's nutritional value has been completely cancelled out. 
but he hadn't come home. And she'd left work at a reasonable hour, not because of Rafe and his bossiness, but because she was done. Boundaries needed to be drawn. She needed sleep. She wasn't being productive anyway, and she knew that if she was required to be creative, necessary since Dale had basically shit the entire project and she had to start over, she had to be operating on all cylinders. Dozing on the kitchen floor wasn't conducive to that. Staying up watching action movies with the subtitles only, realizing that sound was seriously required when captions read, intense intensity, um, what, and gunfire and explosions, way too tame to explain an entire building turning into ash, also didn't allow for the most restful night's sleep. Also, she was at the idgaff point with Dale. Did he want to fire her? Fine. He wouldn't be able to finish the campaign without her. So, yeah, she'd gone home and ordered pizza, with pineapple because, fuck the haters, and watched bad TV, and she didn't care if Rafe came back to the house. He could stay away forever, or until the next family holiday, which would be coming up far too soon for her taste especially considering that Asher's birthday was two weeks away. Whatever. She'd deal. And Rafe would have to as well, just pull up those big boy britches, man up, and shut his flipping mouth. And keep his tongue to himself. Plus, she hadn't wanted her space to invade in the first place, so if a kiss scared him off, then good. She should have done it long ago. I should do it to my brothers. Then they'd stay away, too, and wouldn't eat me out of the house and home, shuddering and processing that as he was stomping around, getting her Cheetos and popcorn and wine, and not really understanding the whirlwind that was her mind until those words actually crossed her lips, she realized what she'd said. Kiss her brothers? Ew, she muttered. No! I am so not doing that. Definitely not. No freak! The lock clicked in the front door, screeching in the metal slot, and she froze, a glass of wine in one hand, her bag of Cheetos in the other. Her face was covered in green goop. She had her most unflattering pajamas beneath her unflattering and holy robe which was fuzzy and cozy, but ratty as hell. And, she turned, saw Rafe walking into her house, bags hung on his wrist, she barely fought the urge to whirl around and run upstairs, to go and hide in her bedroom. Because of the kiss! Because she was in the most unflattering clothes she owned, with the most unflattering face mask in the history of all faces masks globe onto her face. She set her wine down. Rafe moved into the kitchen, the bags crinkling, and... Fury filled her. It began in her toes, sparking and prickling up through the arches of her feet, tingling along her calves, the backs of her knees, her thighs, across her stomach, and up between her breasts. Her words bunched up on the tongue, ready to whip forward, to slash and cut and wound. And her nape prickled her arms strained, and her fingers clenched tight into fists. The bat of Cheetos crinkled as her hand tightened, but thankfully she didn't have her wine glass in hand, or else the stem would have certainly shattered. Well, there was nothing for it. A breath, ignoring Rafe as he made his way into the kitchen. She turned back to the counter, and forced her hands to relax, lest her Cheetos be reduced to dust, and after tucking her bag of popcorn beneath her arm, she deliberately picked up her refilled glass of wine and started for the family room, intending to walk right by Rafe. And still ignoring him. If that wasn't obvious. Because he was evil and awful and a really good kisser. Ugh. C.O.R. Nope. Not Goanna do it. She sidestepped his outstretched arm and moved into the family room. Cheetos and wine glasses on the coffee table. 
remote snatched up and finger poised to hit the play button. Throw pillows plumped in. A familiar bakery box was in front of her face. Rafe sank onto the coffee table, nudging her wine glass to the side, the Chardonnay sloshing up near the rim, almost splashing over the top. She narrowed her eyes. If he spilled so much as one drop, so help her God. He settled the glass and stashed the wine safely next to her Cheetos. Fine. The man could live. For the moment. He crouched, trying to intercept her gaze. But she wasn't going to let him go there, so she deliberately kept her eyes plastered over his shoulder. At least until the box rattled slightly, cinnamon wafting up to tease her sense of smell. Cinnamon. A Molly's box with cinnamon seeping out of the cardboard. He didn't. The man hadn't. Seriously, he hadn't bought her an entire coffee cake from Molly's. That was going to go straight to her ass, and she wasn't joking. She also wasn't going to turn it down. Cora, he began. No, damn it. Stay strong over the glorious scent of cinnamon and a drizzle of cream cheese. Even if her mouth was watering, and her stomach was definitely not on the stay strong train. She clicked the play button. A sigh, then the remote was out of her hand, the pause button pressed, and her glorious reality binge paused for the moment. It's fine, she said, reaching for the remote. Apology accepted. We can pretend that never happened. Now let me watch my show. I didn't even apologize yet. Consider yourself off the hook, she muttered. I know how much you hate apologizing. I don't. She glanced up at him and lifted her brows, and that was enough to half his denial. Fine, he muttered. I don't like apologizing, he dropped the box into her lap. But I should anyway. And didn't that feel good? Her kisses made men run and apologize. Joy. C.O.R. God, why wouldn't this end? But all her protests and the snarky response would just draw this out, so she was just going to grin and bear it, and, okay, she wasn't going to grin and bear it, she was just going to bear it. I'm sorry, he said. I shouldn't have done that. Then, silence. And she realized that was all he was going to say. Some apologies. Shouldn't have done that. Right. You shouldn't have questioned my work habits considering that I'm a grown woman who can choose how many hours I work and what time I wake up in the morning, she lifted her brows higher, waiting for him to challenge her. But also, sore of holding her breath, waiting to see if he was going to acknowledge the kiss. Which felt like more than a kiss. It felt like an undoing like the moment his lips had touched hers, every single part of her had been undone. Torn apart. Then stitched back together in a way that left her feeling changed in a way she hadn't wanted. Ever. There was more silence, tense this time as his emerald eyes locked onto hers. Then he said gently, I worry about you. Not acknowledging it. Right. That wasn't unexpected. It also shouldn't hurt. But if they weren't acknowledging things, she could wrap that pain right up in there with the kiss. Pretend it never happened. Be as good as new. Her chin came up. But I'm a grown woman, and I can choose how much I work, a beat. And sleep. A muscle began to tick in his jaw, making her confidence begin to trickle back in. Goodbye, pain. Hello. Cora. She was back, bitches, and she was going to win this fucking conversation. If winning conversations was a thing, and damn it, yes, winning conversations was a thing. Hell, it was an important thing, especially with an annoying man who wanted to interject himself into her life. The good news was that she was on the precipice of winning this conversation because they were on the precipice of acknowledging the kiss, and heaven forbid Rafe to do that. Not when he was trying to get a medal by pretending it hadn't happened. And know what? She'd take that win, any freaking day of the week. 
right? She pressed. That muscle continued to tick. His eyes held hers, the air between them crackled. Yes, he said finally. I overstepped, and it won't happen again. Victory! She was ready to dig out her pom-poms from somewhere deep in her closet and do a cheer. She was sure she could dig out some 2468 who do I appreciate from the recesses of her mind. But she could be gracious. Out loud anyway. Thank you, she snagged the remote again, started to hit the play button, then hesitated. You know what would really make your apology all that much better? His lips pressed flat amusement nowhere present on his face. Except in the corners of his eyes, trickling into those emerald depths, warming and glimmering in. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a plastic-wrapped fork. This? Her heart did a pitter-patter. Then she shoved it down, plastered a smile on her face, and snatched the fork. Yup, snatched it. Because she had an evening of Cheetos and coffee cake, wine, and reality TV, she was going to dive right into it. Even if her heart did another pitter-patter when he sank onto the opposite edge of the couch. But that pitter-patter was squashed in a second when he pulled out a second fork.